Welcome everyone to the Remedy Book Club. In this series, we will be looking at other forms of media that have a similar feel to the Remedy Connected Universe. These can be books, films, TV shows, really anything that gives us the same vibe. The intention of this series is to break down other stories and analyze how they are similar to the games we love. It is also a good opportunity to introduce everyone to other things that you may find interesting if you're a fan of the RCU. There will be spoilers ahead. If you have not experienced this video's piece of media yourself and would like to, I recommend pausing and reading or watching them before coming back. If you would like to be included in the club itself, everyone on Patreon has access to the material in advance so that we can all go through it together. We also have an exclusive area of the Discord to discuss them as we go. With all that out of the way, let's get into the 1942 novella, The Unpleasant Profession of Jonathan Hogue. For those who have followed the channel for a while, you probably have heard me speak of it before. The story begins with the titular character concerned about his sanity. Mr. Hogue has a problem. He doesn't remember what he does during the day or what he does for a living. From the moment he leaves his home in the morning, his memory goes blank. At a medical facility, Jonathan Hogue met with a man named Dr. Potbury regarding a mysterious red substance found under his fingernails, fearing it was blood. His imagination ran wild with the implications. Without confirming what exactly it was, the doctor kicked him out of the office and told him never to return. The first act involves Mr. Hogue hiring two private detectives to follow him and try to determine what he does for a living. For the rest of the story, the narrative shifts to the perspective of Cynthia and Edward Randall, a married couple who runs the PI firm. They consider this investigation below their normal standards for a case, but are given an advanced payment far above their normal fee. Excited about an easy paycheck, they begin to follow the man. This is where things begin to get weird. After Mr. Hogue leaves their office, Cynthia takes note that the armchair where the new customer sat bore no indication of his presence. The thick layer of dust was not disturbed despite him sitting in and touching it, almost as though he was never there in the first place. Splitting up, Edward follows their charge to a multi-story office building. Cynthia waits outside to track both of them. Ed follows Mr. Hogue up to the 13th floor of the building and learns that it is a jewelry company named Deathridge & Co. After reuniting, the Randalls begin to question if this case is more than it appears. You see, Deathridge & Co. does not exist. After returning to the building later, they discover that there is no 13th floor, despite Ed having been there earlier that morning. And Cynthia noted that Mr. Hogue stopped her husband at the entrance to the office building and they had a conversation before entering together. However, Edward is adamant that this never happened. He had never spoken to him at the building. Their recollection of events are not in line with one another. They are unsure if Ed hallucinated what he saw on the 13th floor, or if Jonathan Hogue is playing an elaborate prank. Questioning one's sanity, the memories one has, and even mysterious places that may or may not be real, sounds familiar. Two detectives drawn into a mystery beyond their understanding. But what happens next draws even more parallels to the RCU, one that a certain pink flamingo would approve of. Mirrors are more fun than television. Later that evening, Jonathan Hogue returns to the Randalls residence to get an update. He has no memory of the office building, of Deathridge & Co, or even seeing Edward there. But he does claim that there is a man in the mirror that watches him. That night, Mr. Randall is awakened by a voice from the mirror. A man named Mr. Phipps invites him into the mirror world. Taken down the hall, he finds himself in a boardroom filled with people he doesn't know. It turns out that this is the boardroom located on the 13th floor. This is Deathridge & Co. The chairman of the board is a man named R. Jefferson Stoles. He instructs Mr. Randall to cease his investigation into Jonathan Hogue, or else. Mirror Dimensions and the idea of being watched by someone within it is something that tracks all the way back to Max Payne. Address Unknown is a TV show that deals with a man named John who believes his evil doppelganger named John Mira has stolen his life and appears in the mirrors. In Control, Jesse enters the Victorian mirror to another dimension. Cauldron Lake itself is just a mirror to the ocean below. While the nature of what is found in the mirror reality in this book is very different, the idea is very familiar for Remedy fans. At this point, Mr. Stoles begins to tell a story about the origin of the universe. In the beginning, there was the bird. At this point, the board members covered their faces as if terrified by something. 
Every time the bird is mentioned, these people perform this same gesture. In the nothingness of space, the bird bore the power of life and wove together a nest. Laying a hundred eggs, it waited for a million years for them to hatch. From each egg, a hundred sons of the bird were born. The nest was so large that each of them had their own space to rule as king. For 20,000 years, they fought and ruled. Over time, some of the sons began to believe they were wise and strong like their creator. They began to create creatures like unto themselves and breathed into their nostrils, giving them life, so that they might have sons to serve and fight for them as well. The bird was not pleased as the sons of the sons were soft and stupid. Those of the first generation were cast down and chained by the second generation. But the stupid and weak could not hold down the sons, so the bird placed cruel beings that were more powerful to prevent the sons from breaking free. This game continues to be played to this very day. The members of this board believe Mr. Randall to be the weak and stupid generation. They believe that Cynthia and Edward Randall are interfering with one of the chained ones, Mr. Hogue. Holding up a mirror, they show Mr. Randall his wife sleeping back in reality, threatening her and him about the consequences of their actions. If they do not stop, drastic actions will be taken against them. This type of story bears more religious themes, the creator's creation going on to make a new life. While we do not have information on the origin story of the Remedyverse, we do have realms of pure creation, a family of people who govern the ebbs and flows of reality. The Randalls have accidentally peeked behind some doors about reality that the second generation are not permitted to see. After crossing the threshold to the other side of the mirror, Mr. Randall believes this to be only a dream. The private investigators continue their work. Over time, things escalate. More visits from the board, more odd occurrences surrounding Mr. Hogue. After some time, a delivery man arrives to bring a full-height wall mirror into their home, something that neither of them ordered. It was placed on the wall solely so the board could keep an eye on them. Eventually, their refusal to end their investigation leads to Cynthia's soul being stolen as ransom, locked in a bottle within the mirror reality, forced to remain asleep until her soul can be freed. Again, sound familiar, right? In order to not give a full synopsis, we will skip ahead to the ending and the real reason I find the story relevant to the Remedy Connected universe. After being rescued, Cynthia and her husband decide to inject Mr. Hogue with a psychotropic drug, hoping it will jostle his memory. And it does. The man's entire demeanor changes and the effects of the drug immediately cease. He gives them a shopping list and tells the couple to meet him at a rest station outside of town if they want to know the truth. Cynthia wants to run, afraid of what Jonathan Hogue has to say. Conversely, Edward needs to know. Meeting the man, they have a picnic under a tree in a nearby field. The unpleasant profession of Jonathan Hogue is simply that he is an art critic. But it is not paintings or jewelry that he examines, it is reality itself. He tells a story of an art student whose project was to create a new universe. After turning in the first draft of his project, he was told to make some changes before resubmitting. This thing about the bird and the suns didn't make for good art. However, instead of starting anew, he simply painted over his creation, a fresh coat of paint over the reality where the bird ruled. The student erased the bird entirely, but the sons of the bird remained by accident, leaving them to become an afterimage, only able to present themselves through the mirrors telling stories of their creation which were no longer true, but their actions were predicated upon their false belief. In art theory, this is called a pentimento. It is defined as a visible trace of earlier paintings beneath a layer of paint on a canvas. The remnants of a previous work that resides in the final product because the artist changed their mind halfway through. After this student's project was finalized, it went to the critics to be graded. In this setting, the critics enter the art to judge it. They incarnate into the world with no memory of what they are, choosing to examine the world through the eyes of the people who occupy it. There are tens of thousands of critics alive in the world, unaware as they experience life and the universe the student created. Only after death do they remember who they are and pass a grade on the creation. 
However, through their investigation, the Randalls prematurely woke up Jonathan Hogue to his true purpose as a critic. After reviewing the project, the art critic determined that this universe is not up to the standards of the institution. He will instruct the student to start all over again from scratch this time. He appreciates some of the details of the art, but in the end, it is flawed. The pentimento that is the Sons of the Bird is enough to make this an imperfect work of art. The universe itself will be wiped clean and a new one created in its place. The art critic, Mr. Hogue, instructs the Randalls to get in their car, roll up the windows, and drive south. Never along the path should they roll down the windows. He then leaves. The couple follows his instructions. They drive and watch outside of the window, people wandering about their day unaware of what is happening. Cynthia briefly rolls down the window and is shown that there is nothing outside of their car. Pitch black, a void of creation, very much like the dark place when nothing is there. The art student has gone back to the blank canvas and is preparing to create a new universe. As soon as she rolls up the window, the world returns, hiding them from the reorganization of reality preserving them during this transition, much like the shoebox does. Eventually, they come to a small village. By this time, the student was complete and a new universe has been made. In this new world, the Randalls start a new life in a home that has no mirrors. Every night, as a precaution, they handcuff themselves together before bed. Just in case. Alan Wake is a game that focuses on the act of creation about the powers behind the scenes of reality. Do you think the concept of a pentimento exists in the Remedyverse? Echoes of a previous creation that bubbled up to the surface. In the Dark Place, many versions of reality lay on top of one another, much like the Sons of the Bird are just under the surface of reality in the novel. The art student made two attempts at his project, and they overlap one another in the mirrors. According to Samantha's dream, Thomas Zane created a baby universe by reciting a secret poem. If this is possible, then what were the circumstances of the RCU's creation? Was there an artist that manifested the reality where Alan and Jesse reside? Mr. Dorr warns Alan that he is opening up and peeking behind too many doors, things that some people are not meant to see. In a similar fashion, the board in the mirror actively prevent the art critic Jonathan Hogue from awakening threatening the Randalls to stop peeking in. With that, we conclude the first project for the Remedy Book Club. If you enjoyed, please advise if there is any stories or films that you think we should include in a future episode. See you all next time. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, please drop a like and subscribe to receive updates on future uploads. If you would like to help support the channel, a Patreon has been set up and the link is in the description below. Have a great day and peace be with you all.